It is 8.13 and we are back with our latest edition of First and Finest. And this morning we are joined by Brian Foley of Connecticut's Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. Brian, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, Angelo. Thanks for having me. Good morning. So it has been an incredibly busy, chaotic week. You mentioned that there were no shortage of stories to talk about. I want to start things off with the Capitol riots that took over the nation's capital on Wednesday. So how did your department react to what happened there? And how do we prevent something like that from happening here in Connecticut? Because, I mean, we did see protests at our Capitol as well. Those did, thankfully, remain under control. Yeah, so, you know, early uh, Wednesday, we started to hear uh, different things coming in. And, and, you know, we have a lot of, at the Division of, Emergency, uh, uh, Division of Public Protection, we have a lot of uh, avenues that uh, people can get notification to us. And CTIC was one of the first ones to say, hey, look, at there might be something going on down in D.C. And, and our Division of Emergency Management, they started to talk to us. We also have a trooper uh, detached to the FBI down in New York City. And all of them began to, you know, send us information about what was going on in D.C. Uh, Commissioner Ravella, uh, right away when stuff like this happens, uh, and it's nothing new as there's been protests nationally for years now, uh, he immediately turns into, okay, how can we protect Connecticut? How can we protect the people here in Connecticut? Uh, and that's, what, that's where we went to. Uh, we, of course, right away we connect, contacted with the Capitol Police Department, where we are right now, uh, and talked to them about um, possibly coming in this direction. Uh, they're very well prepared. They've been dealing with protests here again for years, uh, and uh, they have this place very well protected, and they were obviously aware of what was going on as well. Uh, so we had a lot of avenues available to us. We started to watch, and then uh, CTIC actually put out uh, direction to all the police departments around Connecticut to uh, be aware of what's going on down there, uh, take, take action as necessary. Uh, we did actually reach out to some police departments individually. And one more thing, I, I want to say that, that Colonel Malikas of the Connecticut State Police, prior to being a trooper, he was assigned to the Capitol Police Department down in D.C. And to have his level of expertise as we were watching this uh, was invaluable to us and invaluable to the state. I also heard from some elected officials in, in D.C. that you reached out to them just to make sure that they were safe. Was any extra protection provided? We, Angela, we can't really talk about specifics as to what we did, but certainly uh, after coordination with the governor's office, and we reached out to uh, all uh, elected officials down in D.C. to make sure they were safe. Uh, we also wanted to establish a line of communications with their staff uh, if there was any concerns about personal safety, property safety uh, back here in the, in the state of Connecticut. Uh, some of that did require uh, specific conversations with local police departments. Uh, but some of it did require some uh, minor uh, adjustments in, in, in action on, on law enforcement's part, but uh, nothing major. It's good to have an open line of communication, and that, and that, that communication continues uh, as we speak right now. No, everybody's okay at this point. And then also on Wednesday, we had this huge story coming out of Hartford. There was an officer involved shooting on Enfield Street. But this case was a little bit different in the fact that it involved an FBI task force. We also know state police are involved in that task force. I know I was out there. I mean, the police presence out there was absolutely crazy. Um, it seemed like a huge investigation. So can you just get us up to speed on what we know at this point? Okay, so these uh, federal task force, Angela, are in all the cities across uh, Connecticut and, and, and basically across the country. And it's the FBI, they have task forces, DEA, uh, the U.S. Marshals. A lot of the federal agencies have uh, their own individual task force in the cities and around, and around the state of Connecticut. And how it works is uh, usually a police department will detach two of their own officers to be assigned, as, in this case, to the FBI, uh, and they work with the FBI. And it's, and it's a great relationship in that uh, the FBI, who might not have all the information, the intelligence, and the knowledge of the, of, of within the city, uh, they can use that of the officers, and the officers, again, have the street knowledge, the street informants. Uh, they share those with the FBI, and at the same time, the city can benefit from the FBI, the federal resources, uh, as well as federal prosecution on federal cases within the city. Uh, so it's, it's a, a great addition to police departments around the city. And that's uh, this FBI Federal Task Force is operating in, within the, the city on Wednesday. I'm going after Brandon Spence, uh, by the way, who's no stranger to law enforcement, known to carry guns, uh, uh, no stranger to Commissioner Ravel and I from our days back in Hartford. And, and uh, we weren't surprised to see, unfortunately, back on the radar here. Uh, that was the, uh, the target of the investigation. He uh, was not the one who was uh, um, uh, shot and killed during the police-involved shooting. 
Uh, so when that shooting occurs, obviously a lot of law enforcement responds. At this point, uh, the Connecticut State Police, while they do have troopers assigned to these federal agencies around the state of Connecticut, including the city of Hartford, uh, they were not uh, in, in the city during the, this event. But following the shooting, obviously, uh, our task force uh, troopers responded. And also some troopers uh, from Troop H came in to assist with traffic. As you, as you mentioned, An Angelo, it was very uh, busy. Uh, when these things happen, it's a little different than when a, a typical police shooting happens with, say, a local uh, police officer state trooper. Uh, there's some nuances to be worked out with the federal prosecutors and the, uh, uh, the Connecticut State's Attorney's Office. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the state's attorney kept it, and in, in this case, it's uh, Pat Griffin out of New Haven, uh, which is, uh, in, as far as state's attorneys go, he is probably the most transparent uh, to work with, and so it's a benefit for the city of Hartford to have this New Haven prosecutor. He understands the cities. He understands uh, people's needs. There are varying levels of transparency goals between, um, say, let's say, let's start right at the neighborhood, to a community, to a city, uh, to a, a local police department, to the state, and to the feds. Uh, and there could be varying goals of transparency. Certainly, uh, Pat understands uh, the needs and transparency needs of the city of Hartford, um, and, he, and he's working as good as, he, as, as best as he can to get through those. I also had another question on this story. We did get an update yesterday. The New Britain Police Department says one of their detectives has been placed on desk duty pending an internal investigation. Now you said this task force is made up of lots of different departments. Can you provide any insight on why that might be their involvement in all this? Standard protocol, Angelo. Look at um, so just because you know, you, let's say like, again, let's go. Let's, let's say the city of Hartford. Let's say Hartford has a detective assigned to the FBI task force. That doesn't mean that those detectives are pinned down uh, to the city of Hartford. So New Britain has a, a, a detective assigned to the task force, even though he's out of the New Britain. Uh, it benefits the city of Hartford to have uh, everyone's knowledge in there, so that that task force can move around uh, the state or, or as needed. Uh, and so the fact that he's on desk duty, that's going to be standard protocol uh, for anyone that's involved in a police shooting uh, after a shooting. To be put on uh, desk duty. It's traumatic for everybody involved. It's to the, to the benefit uh, of everybody involved as well. So uh, it's, there's nothing to be read into there. A lot to stay on top of here, but switching topics now, we're starting to see a lot of warnings from officials regarding scams centered around COVID-19. So can you just talk about what people need to know regarding these scams, especially as we've got these stimulus checks coming in? Yeah, I mean, that, that's nothing new here, and it happened last time around when the checks come in. People are trying to scam those checks away, and unfortunately, they're targeting, obviously, the elderly uh, and people that aren't so savvy te uh, technology-wise, and they're doing it through phone, text, and email. Uh, look at... No one's going to ask for your financial information, your credit card information, your social security number. Uh, this, the, the government is not going to do that for your checks. So um, you need to be very careful of what you're doing. Another one is also around the vaccines. You know, there's scams coming in now about the vaccines where, you know, you're getting emails, calls and texts for people to um, buy uh, early access to the vaccine, uh, pay to get uh, the vaccine. That's not how it works. So uh, again, you have to be careful opening up any sort of emails, phones, or text messages around this. Don't share your, your social security number. Don't share your personal financial information. Uh, if you think there's something wrong, please contact the Department of Community, uh, Consumer Protection around the vaccine, to your local public health officials, and local law enforcement on both if you really, have, uh, you really think there's an issue. But uh, be careful. Those scams are out there, and it happens every time there's something like this, unfortunately. Uh, just be vigilant and, and try to reach out and help uh, the older folks that might not be so savvy around these things and see if they need any help uh, figuring out what is uh, legitimate and what isn't information and just to end things here we have state police recruitment kicking off this week tomorrow actually so what do you want people to know on that front yeah, so, so uh, two, two things happened in this week. One, we have a, a massive police academy starting at the Connecticut State Police Academy. 137, I believe, recruits are going in uh, this week, which is uh, very big. Or it's going to go virtual, obviously, uh, with COVID-19. The, the academy has been um, affected uh, greatly, but obviously they're getting it done. As They just had a class come out recently uh, in the fall, and now they, they're, they're just sending another one in now. And in the, the fall was done almost entirely virtually uh, to some degree or differently than it was before, and that's what's going to happen uh, this time. We also have a, uh, a recruiting drive. We have 136 going in. We have a lot more troopers to get through as there's a major staffing shortage for the troopers in the state of Connecticut. Uh, you're going to hear a lot this week and uh, next week on the recruiting efforts that we're trying to make here. Uh, be a Connecticut State Trooper .com is the site that you want to go to if you're thinking about being a trooper. Uh, but again, we'll have a, a lot of stuff in the media, a lot of stuff out there. If, if you ever considered uh, getting into law enforcement, consider being a Connecticut, Connecticut State Trooper uh, and and consider signing up. It's a great job.
Looking forward to it. Brian Foley, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, Ange. Have a great day. All right, and just a reminder, coming up at 10 a.m. today, the real story, we talked to Representative DeLauro as well as Representative Johanna Hayes, who was actually on Capitol Hill with her son when all of that chaos broke out. Again, that is coming up at 10 o'clock this morning. But still to come here on the Fox 61 Morning News, Connecticut gearing up for phase 1B of COVID vaccinations. We are breaking down what groups could be next in line. Plus, the UK variant strain is here. Health officials announcing the highly contagious COVID variant has been diagnosed in at least two Connecticut patients. What it means for all of us 